Hello, everyone. Welcome to um, another Friday edition of High Rounds. We're going to move pretty quickly into the presentation because there's a lot of material to cover. Um, so before we begin, my mask up, I just wanted to welcome our um, ID fellowship applicants who have joined us today from afar. Um, thank you to Natalie, Jahenzib, Sharon, and Samuel for joining us. Um, but I will turn it over to a person that needs no introduction, although maybe he will give something. I'm supposed to embarrass him. I couldn't come up with anything other than he used to model and he loves talking <laughs> about that. Uh, but I will pass it over to Dr. Davy Smith. Thank you. I, thanks, Jill. I am sure that I will embarrass myself with my slides or something along the way. I want to give a big shout out to the applicants who are interviewing. So really thank you for taking a look at our program. My name is Davy Smith. I'm the Head of Infectious Diseases and Global Public Health and a professor here. My pronouns are he, his, and I'm going to be talking about how do we get out of another epidemic. So here's my disclosures. Um, I got these slides from Ankita, Susan, Christine, Stephanie, Rehan, and Tim. <laughs> a very little bit of this is uh, my own doing, and the ones that are bad, will, will those are mine. Um, here's my outline today. Um, we're going to cover a lot of stuff. I'm going to go quickly, but I'm hoping that we have questions, time for questions. And I, you know what? If you have questions in the middle, just ask, and I'm happy to answer them. And then if we don't get to everything, that's also okay. But I did want to start off with a quote from a friend <laughs> and uh, one of my heroes. Um, he says, there are some days when you don't feel like being the gay in the room, right? Um, but I don't have that option because it's the right thing to do. So today, I'm going to be the gay in the room, all right? Okay, so let's talk about the outbreak. So uh, California had a state of emergency about um, MPOX, uh, followed by San Diego County, followed by the US. So it is a health emergency now. Unfortunately, it didn't mean a lot of new resources for this outbreak. It's just like, oh yeah, that's going on. Um, but we're gonna talk about what sort of resources are needed and how that we should be delivered. But when and where did all this start? Um, and MPOX was first discovered in the lab in monkeys in 1958, and that's the reason that they got the moniker uh, monkeypox. But the primary carriers are actually rodents, um, and they're zoonotic transmissions for the largest part, and they're part of the orthopox viruses, and they were most, mostly in Western and Central Africa before 1990, 1990 to 1999, uh, 2000 to 2009, 2010 to 2017. And we'll talk a little bit about why this sort of kept going back and forth, uh, but this might have been a really good time for us to have increased our vaccination campaigns. <laughs> um, however, since it is a zoonotic transmission um, uh, virus, it's probably unlikely that we'll ever be able to fully eradicate it. Um, and it's been endemic there. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit of, I'm going to have a little story about prairie dogs in a second. And that's the reason we've been looking at them. But here, where, here is where we are in the world at the moment. All these cases represent um, what they would call endemic MPOX. And then these other cases are the outbreak of epidemic MPOX throughout the world. And right now, there are 110 countries with 53,000 cases confirmed and another 3,000 cases that are suspected. Um, almost 500 new cases have been reported um, since September 2nd. Here's where we are in the US. The darker colors are the, the states that have the higher rates of MPOX or the more numbers of MPOX, close to 20,000 cases. I'm sure we're more than 20,000 cases now and almost and probably over 4,000 cases in California. So let's talk a little bit about when. So everything was going fine in the world, except if you were in Africa, which is a common saying in public health, which is a problem. But then they started seeing an outbreak happening about end of May to June among men who have sex with men in the European region. And then the blue, I think, is in the Americas that started happening in June and July, which is exactly what we saw here in the US picking up. And then this is San Diego as well. It is nice to see a good thing that the numbers are starting to come down in all of these different regions, which we'll talk about in a second. So who in the US? Well, this is the age groups, mostly 21 to 50, uh, with a big peak between 31 and 35. This is also 
classic um, for sexually transmitted infections as well. So HIV hits this group the hardest. Syphilis, gonorrhea, chlamydia. This is also mostly men. Um, that's the dark blue. Oh, I think that's blue. Um, and very few women. So who else in the United States by race and ethnicity? So white, uh, Hispanic, or Latino uh, ethnicity. And then magenta color um, is uh, black and African-American and disproportionate for the numbers of, um, that we have here in the US. So it's back to hitting more of the communities that get hit the hardest by infections, infectious diseases. So who in San Diego um, looks basically the same. We have a good split between Hispanic or Latino and white um, with 8% black or African-American and then mostly in the central region around 56% of the cases there. And we have some people who are experiencing homelessness um, around 4% and we have 3% hospitalizations. So who are these people? Wait. I broke it. Um, well, you know what? This is a good time to stop and ask questions. Does anybody have any? I can ask a question about the hospitalizations. Are sure. they, what are they related to? You know, we're going to talk a little bit more about that in a second, but hospitalizations are mostly related to pain. So people have really bad proctitis or sore throat and perhaps they can't even swallow. I don't think we've admitted anybody like that here in San Diego yet, but mostly about proctitis, proctitis pain. So they need to get admitted for that. Did I break it? Okay, there we go. Arvin's so good. All right, who in the world um, is getting it? Um, it's vast majority is men who have sex with men, 95%. Um, um, there's also a lot of about 44, 45% of people or HIV positive, um, there are some health workers, some a lot of travel history, a um, lot of people reporting uh, sexual transmission or sex at the time that they uh, were exposed. Um, hospitalization rate is around 8% for the world. And then there are some people who um, have been admitted to the ICU and some have died. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. So who else in San Diego? Um, this looks basically like what it does in the world, 98% men, and then gay, lesbian, same gender loving around 85% or eight, and 8% bisexual. We have some 5% reporting being heterosexual. Okay, now I'm gonna tell a little bit of the story, all right? We're gonna go back to 2003. And this actually starts my rant. So just let's just, I'm gonna be the gay in the room, but here's a very cute ga uh, Gambian pouch rat, right? And they're pets, people have them as pets. And what happened was that somebody in 2003 got a shipment of Gambian rats. They then got distributed um, to different facilities and also one that had prairie dogs. And Gambian rat, as I said before, is the MPOX is um, mostly a rodent. Uh, carried infection and it got into the prairie dog population. And then people who got prairie dogs um, ended up getting infected with mpox. My big question with that is that went away relatively quickly. Didn't really get too far. I broke it again. Marvin, did, did I just push a button? Okay, so what is the difference there? Next slide. Okay. What'd you do? Oh, okay. You're just magic. Okay, but why didn't we learn? So that, that epidemic got taken out very quickly. People uh, jumped on it, got rid of prairie dogs, got rid of Gambian rats, um, isolated people disclosed. Hey, I got a prairie dog. Hey, I got a Gambian rat. Hey, I have these lesions, right? There was no stigma associated with it. There was no vulnerable populations that were being hit by that infectious diseases, by, by that infectious disease, and it was able to be knocked out. But how many of y'all remember Shigella being a problem? This was just 2017, I think, yes. Among people who were, um, this one is among men in Southern California, 
Uh, and this one is among people who were uh, unstably housed or experiencing homelessness. Very common vulnerable populations for infectious diseases. They just love it. And then before that, what about hepatitis A? Same population, same epidemic spread, same problems that we have um, with uh, vulnerable communities and spread of infectious diseases. Right? But every time that I talk to somebody about that, it's like, ah, you know what? Stigma is not real <laughs> for being uh, gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, intersex. Um, it's just not. We have this huge pride parade. This is what we do. This is down Sixth Avenue for San Diego's uh, gay pride. So for sexual and gender minorities, you know, really there's no stigma. What are you talking about there? It's really um, about what they're doing. But in reality, this is just what I pulled off the internet last night. Um, and in fact, this one, when I pulled it off, was nine hours before where a Texas judge said, no prep for you because that is sinful for what you're doing if you need prep. That's the stigma that is constantly pervasive. Right? Okay. So my takeaways on this part, and we got other things that we're going to go through today, but infectious disease spreads in vulnerable communities, and especially in those communities that are already stigmatized. Why is that? They're hidden. They must disclose to get services. I am a gay man. I have a rash. <laughs> Can you take a look at it? And oftentimes, we see at STI clinics that people are coming in to the clinic because that's where they're getting their culturally appropriate care, but they have their other doctors who they don't want to tell because that's the society that they live in. They don't want them to know. Um, these communities are oftentimes are very much close-knit for survival, <laughs> and you can look at gay men, you can look at homeless camps, etc. This is how infectious disease spreads. And then stigma is real both internally and externally. We talked a little bit about external, but there's also internal, like, oh my gosh, maybe I just had a sex partner that was ex exposed. I don't want to tell my other sex partner. I'm such a whore. I can't believe that I just did that. You see how the spiral happens. And we have to recognize all of the stigma that's occurring in all those places. The other one, uh, still on my rant, is to devote resources to communities that are being hit. Been giving TV interviews lately on monkeypox and also ranting, but I always get asked, what about the kids that are going to preschool? What about this? What about that? What about, it's never about devoting the resources to the people who are getting hit. It's about, what about me? What about my kids? Great, we should be thinking about it. And perhaps we could have uh, outbreaks in nursing homes or preschools, et cetera. And we should be looking out for them. Jails are another big one. That's a very big vulnerable community. But we need to be devoting resources to the community that are being hit now. And the reason for that is that we can take care of it. <laughs> Unlike COVID, this is something we can actually stop. Um, be prepared, not surprised. And then sustain the public health resources. The reason that we keep getting into this situation is that we keep having stigma and we keep having these outbreaks that happen in these close-knit communities. Um, and we need to do that even when there isn't a public health emergency. Okay, before I go to virology, because I'm a virologist, we have to talk a little bit about virology. I will stop here and see if anybody had any questions. Gigi just made the comment for those here that there was a person admitted for suspected meningitis. Uh, I'm sure I think you were aware of really bad headache. And I, th I think that was the primary reason for admission of the CSF was negative. I don't know if you will talk we'll, about that we'll, person we'll later. About, no, I won't talk about that particular person, but I will talk about the disease process in a second. So, okay, virology. It's a DNA virus, um, part of the orthopox genus. Um, Part of the pox viruses, um, un, but not the chicken pox. I keep getting asked the question, how is this different than chicken pox? Different animal, different, completely different virus. Um, but it is similar to smallpox and to vaccinia and to those types of box, uh, pox viruses. Um, and that's going to be important for how we're going to control it in a second. Um, there's two distinct genetic clades. There's the Central African or clade one and then West African clade three. 
um, it's clear that clade three is causing less severe disease than clade one for now, and that there are a whole bunch of mutations that distinguish it from its previous closest variant. And we'll just look at that for a second. I have Joel here to make sure that I'm okay. Yeah, Susan. I just, I just want to ask, in the literature early on, they've been calling clade one, clade two. Has clade two gone away and they've renamed it three? So we can talk about that for too long. But, but here is, I, I didn't want to get too far into that, but this is the actual phylogenetic analysis. There is a different clade two and whether or not they make that change over and just call this clade two versus that one would be annoying to me, but it might happen. Probably is gonna happen. Um, clade one. Clade two, there's another clade, and then there's a clade three. And this is all the outbreak uh, before, and then this is the one that's outbreaking now, 2022. And this is a completely different lineage. So this is basically, you can think of it as a family tree. There's different genetic differences across this to move it along. Um, these are more closely related to each other than they are to this group. And these are more closely related to each other than those groups. And this one is over here very closely related, but about 40 some odd mutations are different between that group and that group. And the reason why that's important is that it's a DNA virus. 40 mutations are actually quite a bit uh, different and that it probably tells us something that this virus has evolved or is evolved to be able to evade some immune responses and perhaps be more uh, infectious than the previous variants. And perhaps it might explain also that it's less deadly, which is maybe a Good ish news. Okay. Oh, the mouse. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> How he does that. Thank you, Marvin. Okay. Any questions on virology? I think it should be renamed to Orthopox 4. If you just go down the list of Orthopox 1, 2, 3, 4, that's what I propose to the WHO. We'll see what happens. But, but in the meantime, people are calling it MPOX. OK, so let's talk a little bit about transmission. And we just got to talk about it. Lots of people are like, it's not sexually transmitted. Um, it's by direct contact. And yeah, it is. So direct animal person contact, direct person person contact are the most common, actually is in respiratory secretions. It's also in, you can also uh, find live virus in fomites, probably not for very long, um, but it is there. It is a much more stable virus than let's say uh, SARS-CoV-2 is. And there's lots of it in genital secretions, which we'll, I'll show in a second. And there's also um, virus in blood. So it perhaps could be bloodborne. Um, and they are looking at uh, how this impacts our uh, blood supply. Um, okay. I didn't put up my usual slide for sexual transmission. But look, when most people have sex, they do a lot of those other things other than the animal person contact, but person person contact, respiratory secretions, that's what happens during sex. So, very intimate, sustained period, very likely to be transmitted during a sexual act. Oh my God. Okay, I got it, I got it, I got it. Okay. So, um, three reasons monkeypox outbreak are in MSM. One, um, sexual transmis is, transmission is suspected for 95% of all cases. Seminal fluid is positive for uh, MPOX, and patients are reporting anal genital lesions, which is, you know, the main part about having sex. Um, okay, any questions on that? Okay, disease. Um, Time from exposure to onset of symptoms is somewhere around five to 21 days. Probably eight days is what seems to be very clear. Uh, replicates at the inoculation site, so it's kind of like syphilis. Um, and then spreads to regional lymph nodes. So people are like, oh, here's my first tingly feeling. Then my nodes swelled up, swell up. Then I felt bad because I got my initial viremia. So it does get into the blood and then it spreads all over the place after that. And then Duration of symptoms is usually about two to four weeks. So usually about a month, people are feeling pretty crappy. Um, here are the list of symptoms. Um, any rash um, is the number one. 
And then number two is a, a systemic rash. So a lot of people get a flash all over their body. Some people just get it in one place. A lot of people have fever, lymphadenopathy, um, fatigue, headache, muscle ache. Um, some people can be asymptomatic um, and that's very interesting. And it's also a way that infectious diseases like to spread because they don't make you feel bad. So then you can give it to somebody else during that time. Here are the rashes. Um, and just the, basically the stage of how it goes. And you can think of any sort of ulcerated lesion that eventually scabs over and then the scab falls off. And then just my point is another reason not to touch a rash. Here's some other uh, oral and perioral lesions and they can be quite significant. And one of the big ones that we really worry about is if it gets on the eyelid and gets into the cornea, that, that can be a big problem. And these lesions can also be, as you can imagine, disfiguring not during just the time while they're having an active lesion, but what scarring happens afterwards on the face. And then the perianal lesions can be quite significant in the rectum and on the way up. Um, perianal lesion looks like a whole bunch of bad STI pictures to me. Um, case, okay, any questions on just basically what it looks like? My advice at the moment, if you have um, a man who has sex with man, men who comes in presenting with the lesion, you should swab it and send it off for testing. Here at UCSD, we have a very good test, um, a very quick test. Um, so we're lucky with uh, David Pride and Aaron Carlin. Yeah. Um, I had a quick question about the asymptomatic um, spread that you mentioned. Uh, my understanding was that you kind of need a lesion to swab. I didn't know that there was serology that you could test. So do you know how um, those asymptomatic individuals tested positive or how we found out they had monkeypox? So it, it, not by serology. It's actually by the PCR from the blood. But you can also swab the throat if they're asymptomatic. You can swab the bottom if they're asymptomatic. And you should do all those. Um, Fatality rate, um, so for clade one, this is the reason I kept it clade one, clade three, Susan. Clade one is around 10% um, that we've known for a long time in Western Central Africa. And then clade three, it looks to be close to about three and a half percent. And then people were like, really like, oh, they just get bad care in Africa. Maybe it's just because um, clade three really isn't that less deadly. It's just the less care that they get in Africa. So they broke it out around 4.6% um, fat fatality rate in Africa. So it is clearly less deadly than it is than clade one. And what we do know about in non-African countries for clade three is this quote brain inflammation, headache. Um, and these people did have meningitis. So they, they did have uh, CSF that had elevated white blood cell counts, unlike our patient they got admitted for um, worry for brain inflammation from monkeypox. Um, there is a case of somebody who uh, died in Texas who said was, quote, immunosuppressed. I actually haven't seen any follow-up on that at all. I don't know if anybody else has heard anything. Um, so, but it looks like the thing to really worry about is if somebody has it going to their brain and then in the setting of being immunocompromised, which I think is always the thing to worry about. Okay, I'll stop there before I go under treatments. Yeah. I can repeat it. Yeah. So we don't, nobody got treated. None of these people were on treatment. Good, good question. So what are the potential treatments? Um, so here are some that we know that works for smallpox. And since it's, that's orthopox one, according to the Davy, um, nomenclature. Honestly, virologists are horrible at naming things. They just name one, two, three, four. Um, so I think they're probably going to like orthopox four. But orthopox one, uh, we know that uh, immunoglobulin um, works, sodafovir works, brinsodafovir works, which is a form of sodafovir, and ticoviramat. In fact, those last two that are bolded are FDA approved for smallpox. And you're like, who has smallpox? Nobody, hopefully. But if we ever had a smallpox problem, i.e. Um, somebody let it go from 
a lab somewhere, then hopefully we'd have, one of these would still work. However, you know, if I was going to be a mad scientist, I would make a smallpox that was resistant to the medications that were already out there. But anyway, yeah. Uh, rincidofavir um, is approved to treat smallpox. It's a prodrug of sidofavir, so it inhibits the viral DNA polymerase and it incorporates into the viral DNA change, chain. Its safety and efficacy are lacking for mpox because nobody's tried it. Um, it is not available currently through the USC, ABC, EIND, and I'll talk about that, what that means in a second. But why is it not? So they did a study uh, ish. They had three patients who got. Mpox earlier this year, and then got treated with Brit, with Brincy. So these are those little arrows there um, for each of these uh, patients. And these are these are viral loads that are in different places. Like blood is red, um, lesion is black. There's a blood. Yellow is in urine. You can just find it almost everywhere. Upper respiratory tract that swab lesion swab for the mouth. Um, and basically, they treated them. All the viruses went down for everybody. Didn't look a lot different than what they saw in people who normally had um, in pox. But what they did notice was that there was an increase in LFTs. And this is what all these three patients, this is uh, ALT, and they just saw an increase in ALT for people who got the Brincy. OK, we'll talk a little bit more about this. This wasn't a randomized controlled trial. And it turned out when they looked at other people who had mpox who were not treated, they also had elevated um, LFTs. But because of that LFT signal, they said, no, we're not going to try Brincy. Um, they had one patient who was treated with ticoviramat. Okay? So ticoviramat is a, uh, also approved for smallpox. It works by inhibiting the P37 protein of orthopox. So it works both for smallpox and for mpox, and it blocks interactions <clears throat> and is a pretty good antiviral. It's a mono, uh, it's being used as monotherapy, which we'll talk about in a second. And it is allowing for CDC EIND. And the reason for that is, I didn't put that slide in. The reason for that is the one person that was treated with ticoviramate didn't have LFTs, elevations. Uh, not randomized controlled, not um, no placebo, et cetera. So really, it's kind of hard to know. But that was the evidence at the time, and that's what people went with. Uh, one interesting side note is, I don't know if you all know Edie Letterman, who was a, a ID fellow and then faculty over at um, Balboa. Uh, they had a patient who came in who got vaccinia in the military, in the Navy. And then he got the vaccinia uh, vaccine, which is a replicating virus at the time. And uh, he was very immunosuppressed and nobody knew about it. And he got a systemic infection with his vaccinia. And during that time, they gave him both Brincy and Ticoviramat, and it became resistant very quickly to Tico. So even though it was vaccinia, which is kind of a pretty weak growing virus, it was able to become resistant pretty quickly. So a lot of people are worried about monotherapy for mpox using ticoviramat. But we're doing a lot of it. And um, here is uh, the experience from the Davis group for ticoviramat for mpox infections. And I'm just going to quickly show that a lot of them had a previous smallpox vaccination. And some of them had even gotten genios vaccination. Um, many of them had HIV. This is a lot like our experience. And then almost all of them had genital or perianal lesions. And then the number range widely from less than 10 to over 100. OK, any questions on treatment? Picoviramat was monotherapy, because that's the only thing that right now is what's being allowed. And we'll talk a little bit about a study that's getting ready to start. So prevention. So will vaccines work? All right. Um, Mpox is closely related to smallpox. Smallpox vaccine works with Cynia, different virus. And then it was eradicated. Smallpox was eradicated in 1980, mostly through vaccination campaigns. But here's our Mpox cases. Um, and they're going up. 
and they've been going up ever since actually 1990 to 1999. Overall, both, both plates, um, why is that happening? We stop vaccinating people for other months. I get to say, and the only time, the only time in my life I'll ever get to say is I am too young to have gotten the smallpox vaccine. Right. So 1971 and after in the US, we stopped vaccinating for smallpox because it wasn't here. And then the rest of the world pretty much ended up stopping in the 1980s. But that allows a whole bunch of people in the population to now be susceptible. Not for smallpox, because we don't have that, but for the other orthopox viruses, including MPOX. Okay, so prevention. What can we do about it now? Um, the FDA has approved a vaccine for MPOX. That's Genios. It's a live, non-replicating virus. It's two subcutaneous injections four weeks apart. It could be used both for pre-exposure prophylaxis. So if you um, are at risk, you can get it, um, or if you've been exposed, you can get it, and you can get it within 21 days, and it definitely decreases the uh, co course of the disease, but it also um, maybe even can thwart it altogether. Um, there were two, uh, 20 million doses of this vaccine stored in our uh, strategic supply um, less than 10 years ago, but they all uh, expired. <laughs> in 2022. So now we didn't have that much vaccine for only about 1,200 people, um, almost 20,000 MPX cases in the U.S. We just don't have enough. So what happened to the FDA is like, eh, you know, it's actually a really antigenic, immunogenic uh, vaccine. We Maybe we can start splitting those doses, give it in different ways that improve the immunogenicity. We're in a moment of desperation. Let's just cut it and see if we can spread things uh, further, so that's what they're doing now with this uh, one fifth the dose for intradermal use versus the standard dose. Here's the number of vaccines that have been given from uh, the U.S. in the U.S. starting mostly in July on the way up. the The first doses are there in the dark blue, and then the second doses are there in the light blue. So about three hundred fifty-two thousand doses in the U.S. Here in San Diego, we've requested. Uh, 33,000 vials. We got almost 8,000 vials. Um, we, they, the county has distributed 5,700 5, vials that's either put vaccinations in people's arm or distribute them to different clinics, including ours here at UCSD. And then they've reserved about 2,000 vials for post-exposure prophylaxis. Um, so you can get, if you're interested, the monkeypox has a, uh, here in San Diego, you can uh, get these alerts to your phone um, and they'll tell you when you can get your uh, vaccine appointments. And this was Tuesday um, while I was giving a talk with Susan. I got this on my phone. Um, it says appointments are available right now for high-risk clients. Six o'clock, no more vaccination. <laughs> all, the, all, all the slots are filled. Um, bummed me out and actually gave me a lot of hope. And why? Because people want to get the vaccine, right? <laughs> can't give a COVID vaccine away. <laughs> you can't just pay somebody to take it. And we have people lining up, which is great. I, I have to take a little pride that my community is like, yeah, we want to protect ourselves. So that's good. Um, it's still bummy out. It's less than an hour between those two. Okay. I'll switch a little bit of gears here, but so here is a study that they did um, from the CDC in the CDC with uh, Emory and looking at men who have sex with men in terms of harm reduction, okay? So now that the impox is out um, and people are learning about it, has there been a change in behavior? And uh, there has. So 48% of people who were surveyed reduced the number of sex partners, half reduced one-time sexual encounters, and half reduced sex partners on dating apps. Um, and my point with this is that behavior change happens, usually short periods of time, but now would be the time to actually do the short period harm reduction because we have an opportunity to get to know new infections. This, this virus is not like COVID. It's not like HIV with a long incubation period. It is something that we can eradicate out of our community. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about that in a second. Okay, but I thought that was interesting. Okay, before I go to research, 
question. Go ahead. There are a lot of questions that came through. Um, <clears throat> so uh, Shannon asked why the fatality rate has been so much lower so far. Yeah. Well, we, we, don't, we don't know. That's a good question. I don't know. And the reason probably is there is a genetic difference between these two viruses, the previous clade one and clade three, you know, lots of mutations. And that um, probably means it's more infectious, but it also might mean that it's less deadly. There was a question that may have been answered, but I wanted verification from you. So uh -oh. Eric McDonald asked if our monkeypox test targeted the TNF receptor gene that is the subject of the recent CDC lab alert. There were some false positives. Annika Klein said, we have two targets for our assay. One is a region of the viral DNA pole, and another is the specific gene called B7R that includes a protein of unknown function, but she did not think that that um, the TNF receptor gene was part of that. That's correct. You did good, Annika. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, and, and everyone said, thank you. That was very useful. Um, one more question, and then there's some comments, but do you know about, so early or vaccine allocation, there is a, maybe a rumor or some thought that it was related to early syphilis rates in counties. Can you confirm if that was true, that that's how they made decisions about allocation? Oh yeah, that that is how they made yeah. So, so not a rumor. Yeah no so uh you know birds of a feather flock together. So if there's a sexual transmission of increase of syphilis, there's also of gonorrhea, chlamydia, and just to call it what it is, also mpox. Good questions though. Mm -hmm. A hand from Dr. Borges. Thank you, Jill. Uh, I had a question about the emergency stockpiles of vaccines. Do they always let them expire or is there, <laughs> I don't know, like to me, it would make sense to just one year before they're going to expire, they just vaccinate people that might be at higher risk. And that way you produce some herd immunity in case something happens and you don't waste the whole like millions of doses. <laughs> you, you, you need to go work for our stockpile, Anik. Um, uh, this has always been a problem. Actually, I'm going to speak broader about our emergency stockpile. This has always been a problem. We let tons of Tammy flu go to waste. We let tons of vaccinations go to waste all the time. Um, and this particular one, when it was going to expire, uh, we didn't know that there was an impox um, breakout going to happen. But we, in the U.S., but we did know that there were other places in the world that could really use an impox vaccine, and we didn't do it. Shame on us, to be honest. Okay. But if there wasn't an outbreak, you know, if there was no sign of outbreak, wouldn't it still be better to use the vaccines just in case it appears <laughs> in the next five years? Yeah, probably. <laughs> I mean, hindsight is twenty twenty. Um, yeah, maybe. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay, I'm gonna talk a little bit about some research because we have so much that we don't know. I know I put a ton of information in this and you know, can see all my slides and stuff. Um, and there's lots of things out there, but we still, there's a lot that we do not know about MPOX and particularly this uh, clade of MPOX and um, how to best treat it, how to best vaccinate it for it, et cetera. Um, so here's one study that uh, we have going on here at uh, UCSD uh, led by Susan Little looking at um, different ways to give uh, the va this particular vaccination. And going back onto my little bit of a rant, here's USA Today, you have a lump on your arm for weeks. Um, that's a super common side effect. That's the reason why you have a lump on your arm. But lots of people are like, I don't wanna get a shot because then I look around that people are like, oh, you're a whore because you have a red spot on your arm. You must be getting a vaccination. You know, it goes back to that whole I remember when we had Truvada whores and now we have monkeypox problem. I mean, the stigma is real both inside the room and outside the room. Okay. I think some people though have taken that and you know sort of uh, co-opted that and said, look at me, I'm protecting myself. Um, I'm proud to, to have this, this badge. So obviously easier to do it in California and in places like this. Um, but there is a way to try to reframe that or, oh, yeah. yeah, that's how we reframe, you know, I remember, I think I even had one of those t-shirts that said Travato Horror, right? That the people walked around with was like, own it, right? 
Um, language is real. Language is powerful. You got to use it. Okay. Uh, this is a dose reduction strategy, basically to figure out if it's going to work to use the smaller doses, lower doses. Can I go ahead and get my other slide? I have it maybe later. Um, but also um, whether it can be uh, even <clears throat> less of the materials given over time. I think I have a slide for it later. Um, okay, so here's another study that's getting ready to start. In fact, we enrolled our first uh, participant last night. Um, in the study up at LA, and this is called STOMP, and it's a study of picoviramat for monkeypox. Um, but there's lots of studies now for picoviramat for uh, in pox. Uh, POM07 is in um, Africa. There's platinum, which is a UK study. There's a Canadian trial that nobody knows about. And then there's the WHO trial, um, and they're all using basically the same drug at the same dose for the same group. Um, so all trying to see if Tico Baramat actually works. Um, oh, I should say something that Davis study before showed, not that it worked, it's just that it was very well tolerated. So at least that's the good news. And there was not, didn't seem to have a big risk attached to Tico Baramat. Um, so here is the one that we have going on now. It's a two to one randomized blinded placebo controlled study. It's intensely, it has a subset that's intensely uh, uh, sampled. It's with people who have symptomatic um, impox infection. It's superiority design. It's looking at time to clinical resolution, basically with scabs falling off, looking for over 57 days, and then enrollment for eight weeks, and it's all weight-based weight -based TICO. Um, we're gonna look at the time to clinical resolution and people who did and did not get blinded therapy. They're going to get photographs, clinical reports, um, confirmation at participant visits, also, you know, swabbing everything all the time. Um, they do have to have uh, presumptive disease, and then they get confirmed, and that, that's how they continue. The onset of symptoms have to be within two weeks, and they have to have at least one active lesion. Um, if somebody has severe disease, there's another arm of the study that's not blinded. So they get the actual drug. So if somebody has severe proctitis, severe uh, pharyngitis, they have ocular involvement or they have hospitalization or deplesions. There's a lot of lesions that get under foreskins that have to be debrided, can be quite intense. All those severe people can still be part of the study. It's just in the open arm part of the study. Um, so Susan's also our site PI for this study. And this is basically what happens. People come in, get a bunch of swabs, um, STI screens, because they come in at the same time. Um, it's the oral version. Um, and then we get a diaries that people take over time. Oh, and then this slide should have been up there. This is the vaccine uh, uh, slide um, study that we're doing to look at the different doses. So this are people who are don't have MPOX and they don't want to get MPOX, but might be at risk for MPOX. Um, and this to see whether or not there's three different doses, intradermal, two different doses, or a subcutaneous uh, vaccination at two different time points. And then basically to look at what their neutralizing antibody is for MPOX over time after those vaccinations. Yeah. We are enrolling both next week here. So if you got patients, let us know. Two different groups, one with MPOX and the other ones who don't want it, but might be at risk for it. Go ahead. Can they test positive elsewhere and be enrolled in the yeah. first study? Yeah, for STOM. Yeah. Don't like the name, STOM. Um, oh, for this group, um, healthy, up to 50 years old, stable, well-controlled HIV. This is for the vaccination group. Um, Another study, this one's being done at uh, La Jolla Institute, um, and they're looking at what are the immune responses, both the B cell and the T cell responses, as Dr. Seti study, um, along with that group. They're the ones that have been taught us so much about SARS-CoV-2 and vaccination, et cetera, so I'm really happy to see them uh, joining the effort here on MPOX and how that vaccination works. And this is for people who are uh, convalescent with their MPOX or, or getting their vaccine. So all those people are eligible and um, can call uh, or just look up LJI and POX and they'll be the, giving that information there. 
And then plug for the Prepare Institute. If anybody wants to do research on MPOX, there is a developmental grant that's coming out um, for about $50,000 for one year project um, in the context of HIV or someone who's at risk for HIV and MPOX. So if you have any great ideas and want some cash to do those ideas, that's a developmental grant for you. Okay, I'm gonna stop there before I get to another rant. I have a quick question. Ahead, Sorry, I'm saying. in the car. Sorry, I'm in the car. Um, what about, um, I was just thinking about, you know, all the studies with COVID and wondering, you know, comparing natural immunity to um, vaccine immunity. That seems like a, uh, an easy study to do with all our patients who have gotten it and survived it. Um, and I put idea, survive in quotations. Yeah, okay. no, great. can I do that one? It's a great idea, Gigi, and that is exactly what the La Jolla Institute is looking at. So if you have um, patients who got in pox and did great, or maybe even had a hard time, uh, they should go there. And then that group is also going to compare people who just got the vaccination, both HIV positive and HIV negative. So look exactly at your question. What is the immune differences between getting it versus um, getting vaccinated? Okay, so that's already going to be studied. I'm sorry? That's already going to be studied? Yep, yep. That's what they're enrolling okay. now. So if you have any patients. Uh, sorry. No, okay. no, you're good. That's good. I, I think that's super important. From Doug Richmond, since pox viruses are so remarkably stable and expiration dates for some drugs reflect how long decay was tested, not that the drug has decayed, why are the expired vaccines being tested for activity? Or why aren't they why being? Why aren't they? Yes. yes. Why aren't they being? Yes. Uh, that, that's a good question, Doug, and people have already asked that to them multiple times. Um, somebody at the Strategic National stockpile does not want to do that. And he corrected himself saying not being tested. Yeah. There's a comment about treatment, but we'll get to that later. Okay. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. So um, Dr. Little says that we are trying hard to co-enroll in all these studies um, and we've gotten permission to do so um, to make sure that we maximize the information that we get from each of our participants um, time and effort and blood and genital secretions and everything else we take from them. Uh, go ahead, John. Winston has a question. Okay. Okay, thanks. Um, do you know if any of the randomized trials comparing Tecoviramad and placebo will do any uh, seminal fluid analyses since there is the continued question about uh, presence of uh, virus in seminal fluid and potentially infectious virus, uh, just kind of thinking about HSV, which is a totally different virus, but we know that there's a lot of viral shedding, you know, in the first few weeks after the primary infection. And just thinking, you know, if there's any thought that we would perhaps, you know, um, there's a similar, you know, if there's a similar case for MPOX, would we use Ticoviramat for everyone or extended courses? Just wondering what your thoughts are on that. Yep, we are doing it. Uh, well, we're doing it in my trial. So the stop trial, we are getting semen at all the days one, eight, 15, 22, and 29. And we're very interested in 15, 22, uh, well, actually eight as well, looking for resistance perhaps in those different compartments. But I think the only trial that's looking at semen is actually the STOMP trial. So hopefully we'll get that answer soon for you, Dr. Tillman. Thank you. Okay, any other questions on there? Okay. Okay, ready for one more rant? All right, okay. So we can get to zero. I guess I'm gonna end on a hopeful note for here. We got rid of smallpox, we can get rid of mpox, right? Um, but it is gonna require vaccination. So that's how we got rid of smallpox. Ring vaccination, disclosure, um, partner notification, all that needs to take place. And this is the one uh, request, uh, I don't know, but we need to take care of each other. And what I mean by that is you gotta disclose. And you gotta tell your sex partners, and you gotta speak honestly about these things and you gotta encourage each other to get uh, vaccination and you gotta be supportive if you're a clinical provider and getting the information out there and trying to get rid of the stigma that's associated with not getting the care that people need. All that needs to happen in the context of we are all in this together. So let's take care of each other. So that's the vaccination part, right? And we can do it, absolutely can. A Little bit of harm reduction at this time 
is what really could help us get to zero. Okay, previous infections are also a big component of it because once somebody gets inbox, they're not gonna get it again, right? For the most part. <laughs> um, so previous infections, vaccination will really help protect people and then the harm reduction uh, attached to that will also help during this time limited, for lack of a better word, crisis, I think we can get to zero. And I think we're actually already seeing that. I don't think we're gonna get, uh, I think we're on our way down, which is good. And then, any questions? I think I, you brought up vaccinations for people who are already infected. So um, a lot of patients ask, if I've already been infected, should I get a vaccine? I, I actually have a number for you. Um, I had the small pox vaccine when I was a kid. Should I get the vaccine? Um, and then the third, uh, I'm a healthcare worker. I see a lot of uh, monkeypox. Should I get the vaccine? I think those are sort of the three flavors. They're coming in and maybe others have more. If I, if I miss anything, just let me know. So for we do know that people who had smallpox vaccination before got infected. That's the really nice uh, study from the Davis group. So yeah, if you're at risk, get the next dose. We also saw that people who got Genios also got inpox. Um, so what that tells me is that if you are at risk um, and you've gotten infected before, I would probably tell you to go ahead and get the vaccine. But go ahead, Susan. Yeah, they were they they were they were two to four weeks out after. So probably they were just not they might have actually been pre pepped, right? So there wasn't a lot of details in that. Um and yeah, and then the healthcare worker. At the moment, no. I don't want to so it goes to devoting the resources to a group that doesn't have it. We don't see the healthcare worker being infected at the moment. Okay. Other good questions? Uh, oh, Dr. Lee, and I, I can repeat it. Yes, definitely for syphilis. I should have brought that up. But if you have somebody who comes in with syphilis, I would test them for monkeypox. Uh, if they have active syphilis. Um, that for sure looks to be very closely correlated um, across Europe and US data. Um, the other ones are less clear. I, I probably have, I know I have, <laughs> um, so I would. You're saying that for someone who's coming in asymptomatically and we're doing three site testing. Nope. If they come in with an active infection is what- Any active infection do this. Those are the ones that I'm doing. Okay. Asymptomatic screening, I, I haven't done yet. Uh, Francesca says, re with regards to research, there is significant population on campus that might be interested in participating in studies, both treatment and vaccines. They've, um, they've not had a lot of access to vaccines. I don't know if you want to make a comment. Yeah, I... I, uh, I yeah, so I mean, we've been doing a campaign on social media for the um, vaccine study already. Um, there's a bit.ly which I can put in the chat, which actually brings you to our registry and more information about the study. Um, that's when testing the three different dose reduction strategies of the Genios vaccine, and which we'll be starting to enroll next week. And then, yeah, but I mean, but they can, if you want to share the link with with others and spread the word, that would be really helpful. And then we'll have more information on the STOMP trial coming out later as well. Yes. And just because, um, as Davey mentioned too, you know, we really just want to make sure that we prioritize the people that are being hardest hit. So, um, you know, LGBT community, as well as people of color. Um, we definitely want to also make sure that we represent San Diego County demographics. So we try to do our best to kind of follow the communities that are being hit as well. Given the wide uh, interest and uh, desirability of those vaccines, I, I imagine that the Vaccine trials going to roll relatively quickly. Yeah, very fast, which is great. Shannon asks, how should we be timing Genius and the bivalent COVID vaccine boosters? 
Because right now, yeah. right, the recommendation is to yeah. wait to wait, yeah, for four weeks, I believe, for a, a COVID shot booster. How yes. are you advising people? Yeah, four weeks after yeah. they get there. Four weeks. Okay. Sorry if I interrupt. This is Francesca. Yep, go for it. So, <laughs> we, we just sent it out. So uh, if you have received monkeypox vaccine, you have to wait four weeks before getting the booster. Four weeks. Okay. Anything else? I mean, this is just keep going. They're just pouring it. All right. Um, we got a little bit of time. What'd you say? Oh yeah, people can unmute themselves. I don't have to read read these. Um, Annika, do you want to unmute yourself? Sure. Um, so uh, we noticed in the lab actually. So we when we initially brought mon the monkeypox test online, we used a different set of targets, the CDC targets, and we had a lot of indeterminate for complicated reasons. We changed our current targets about two weeks ago, three weeks ago, and the test is a lot better. We really don't have that problem. But we noticed in the last week, especially, that our volumes are really low. And I was wondering if, is that just like a post-holiday effect? Is, are, is the outbreak really, truly declining? And so people are not getting tested because they're having less symptoms. Are people not getting tested, you know, and are, is it stigma, more stigma than before? And so testing has fallen. Or is there something else like people are unaware of the test or dissuaded by previous long turnaround times or indeterminate results. I just thought providers on the call might be able to tell you what they think is yeah, going on. But let's ask the group. Those are good questions. So testing down any reasons why I the, the case rates are going down for sure. But anybody want to have any guesses out there in the community? I have a guess. Go for it. Um, so when we first started testing, we were unroofing the vesicles um, with sharp objects. Um, and then we were told not to do that. And I think our rates of detection went way down. So I, I personally have gone back to using a large bore needle because the, the vesicles are really hard to unroof. Um, and so um, that, that would be my guess just from a clinical standpoint. But yeah. that's my, been my experience. You think you're testing less this week than you were the week before? No, 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 no. I no, okay. I don't. I I do think we I think we're seeing it come down. There were just massive people coming in with various concerns and, and lesions. I think by vaccinating and sorry if I don't have the numbers right, it's over a thousand people probably in San Diego or more than that. Um, and also having treatment. I I think we're starting to bend the curve. Um, so I think we are, I hope, testing less. Yeah, yeah, we we're bending the curve for sure. But we we I do want to give one shout out, Annika. The 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 test is great. You you made the best test I think that anywhere in the country has. So good job. Uh, but I do think we are just testing less for epidemic and so, clinical reasons. Yeah, we just I expected it to increase in volume, and it's actually like really it, it was not what we had predicted. We expected it. We put it on an instrument that can run a lot of volume, and. Uh -huh. We've seen just a, a total okay. fall off of our testing volume, so it's just not what we expected. Can you comment on the value of serologic testing? This came up from our ophthalmology colleagues and what this might look like in, in the future. I think that we will get uh, serology testing that is good later. We don't have it now, so serologies don't help at the moment. I saw Will's hand was up. Will? Yeah, hi. I was just going to um, contribute a little to that to that previous comment and, and discussion about, um, you know, volume. I, 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 you know, run a couple of the morning urgent clinics at Owen and um, for a while there, almost all the slots on Tuesday and Thursday mornings were being filled by likely monkeypox cases. Um, and, and now I, I don't see nearly as many. So I, I do I do feel like we're seeing fewer cases, uh, uh, certainly in, in, from my perspective. Yeah, thanks, Will. Good, are we good? It's also almost nine o'clock. I just wanna, um, Larry Lyle made one comment and I thought this would be maybe a potent, but sad way to end and maybe you have a comment. Let me get back to it. To paraphrase, sometimes you need to be the African in the room. We have had 40 plus years to validate both vaccines and therapeutics, and we did not do this. I agree this is unanswerable. However, do you see any potential emerging infectious diseases that we should be working on? <laughs> <laughs> Good question. Yeah, I like the plug. Uh, we knew that impox was going to happen, honestly, and we did nothing about it. So 
that that's one. Uh, and two, you know, there's other coronaviruses, and there's going to be Nipah virus, and there's going to be other paramyxoviruses, echoviruses. Polio is in the water now. What the heck is going on, right? The world is being, it has always been in danger of having the next pandemic. And we continue to be surprised and not prepared. So I will end there because it's after nine o'clock. Thanks everybody for coming. Have a great weekend. Stay dry, cool, et cetera. Thanks, Thanks Davey.